The date is August 25th, 2000 in beautiful St. Petersburg, Florida, and the weather is absolutely stunning. It's just afternoon in a Eurocopter BK-117 flown by Bayflight out of St. Joseph's Hospital crashes into a radio tower 500 feet above the ground. How could this have happened? Did the pilot lose situational awareness? And how many noise complaints by homeowners on the ground have led to this incident? Coming up on this episode of The Dr. Medic. Before we get too far into this story, I want to re-emphasize the purpose of this channel, and that is to look at the data, to look at the information related to this type of incident in hopes that you or me or anyone else can learn from this incident in order to be safer in the future. This story will deal with loss of life, and while I can understand the emotion that may go along with that, I also have to respect the lessons that can be learned from such an incident. Bayflight is a medical helicopter company that was owned by Rocky Mountain Helicopters at the time and had several bases in the Tampa Bay area of Southwest Florida in the United States. One of these bases was located at St. Joseph's Hospital just north of downtown Tampa, which was the home base for this particular flight crew. One interesting note was that at the time, Medical providers that were on the aircraft, like the flight paramedic and the flight nurse, were not looked at or identified as crew members. Instead, they were officially called medical attendants. This is not the case today. The medical crew are now considered full crew members, which plays a very big role in crew resource management, otherwise known as CRM. This helicopter was a BK-117A3 and was manufactured by Eurocopter with a total number of flight hours of 6,642. The last inspection of the aircraft was completed on March 15th in 2000. In the world of medical helicopters, especially in 2000, the BK-117 is the Ferrari of helicopters. The BK was a very large aircraft for medical helicopters with two 600 horsepower turboshaft engines and the medical compartment, it pretty much resembles the back of an ambulance. With so many medical helicopters being very cramped and tight, the BK had room to move around and even has a full-size stretcher with rear doors to load the patient. This was, and still is in many areas, a very sought after helicopter to fly. It's got tons of power, tons of room, and very well made, and it's very safe. This pilot was a very experienced pilot, even though he was just 38 years old. He held a class two medical certificate and was rated for helicopters and instrument flight. He had a total of 4,367 hours of flight time with 169 hours on type. He was hired by the parent company Rocky Mountain Helicopters about one year prior to this accident. The pilot did have lots of experience flying in the Tampa Bay area as he had worked for several local news companies flying helicopters for the previous 15 years. The crew was at St. Joseph's Hospital on the morning of the accident at 10.05 in the morning when they received a call for a scene flight in Pinellas County on the other side of Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay is a very densely populated area surrounded by lots of waterways, and while the flight times may be very short for the helicopters, they save an awful lot of time on ground transport due to heavy traffic in the area and all those waterways. After going en route at 10.05, it took them just 10 minutes to fly all the way across Tampa Bay and land at the scene. The crew were on scene for just a bit over seven minutes, which was very common for this flight service at the time, as they would normally hot load patients with the engines running and very quickly transfer the patient from a ground ambulance over to the helicopter. At 1022, they departed the scene, taking them only six and a half minutes to land at Bayfront Medical Center on the south side of St. Petersburg. The crew landed at Bayfront at 1028 where the medical crew went inside and transferred patient care to the hospital staff. The crew stayed at Bayfront for nearly two hours, which is not uncommon as they would have needed to restock their aircraft, 
They may have stayed for lunch or they may have been participating in patient care in the emergency room during this time. At 12.12 hours in the afternoon, the crew departs Bayfront in St. Petersburg to return to St. Joseph's over in Tampa. Just four minutes after taking off from Bayfront and headed to their home base at St. Joseph's Medical Center, Bay Flight 3 collided with a nearly 700-foot radio tower over the Whedon Island Preserve Nature Park just north of St. Petersburg. After hitting the guide wire and then the tower, the helicopter spun out of control as its rotor blades flew off in different directions with the main fuselage of the aircraft landing roughly 300 feet north of the tower in a very muddy mangrove swamp. The tower itself also completely fell just after the helicopter hit the ground and was completely destroyed. Sadly, the pilot, the flight paramedic, and the flight nurse were all killed and did not survive the accident. This radio tower was built and completed in 1977 and was used to broadcast AM and FM radio signals across western Florida. The tower did have an omnidirectional strobe on top of it which was shown to be in working order. The entire structure did fall right in the vicinity of the accident and further examination of the tower revealed that there were several fresh marks at the 480 foot level of the structure. The pilot did not have direct access to a hazard map of obstructions for the local area. And this accident, along with many others, helped to pave the way for the broad implementation of terrain awareness warning systems, otherwise known as TAWS, to be installed on medical helicopters. TAWS is a system that provides the pilot with sufficient information and alerting to detect a potential hazardous terrain situation such as a radio tower, a mountain, or even a tall building, and so the pilot may take effective action to prevent a dangerous event that we call controlled flight into terrain. This system is what you may have heard in movies where right before an aircraft goes down, you hear obstacle ahead or pull up. Obstacle, obstacle. Oh, ah. Throughout aviation history, and especially before the implementation of TAWS, there have been many fatal accidents that were caused by controlled flight into terrain. While TAWS is still not a requirement for medical helicopters, they are highly recommended by the NTSB and have been installed on most of today's medical helicopters. Now, remember what I said about this area being very densely populated and bordered by waterways in all kinds of different directions? That creates a heavy traffic pattern, and on top of that, they are also somewhat limited by several large international airports, as well as the very busy MacDill Air Force Base on the south side of Tampa. And one might think that to return to St. Joseph's from Bayfront, that they would simply fly straight across Tampa Bay as that would be the quickest route, right? Well, when it comes to medical helicopters in general, most aircraft would normally want to avoid being out over open water in case of an engine or a mechanical failure as this would give them the option to be able to land the aircraft if they could find a suitable spot on the ground. This is not possible if you are out over open water and contrary to what many people may first think, aircraft such as helicopters sink quite a bit faster than you would believe, giving the crew very little time to escape should they need to do so. So it's far more common for aircraft, especially helicopters, to fly along the coast where they may still be over the water a little bit, but if they need to, they can still land on the ground or on the beach or possibly even shallow water and still have a chance to walk away from the accident. Bay Flight is a very busy medical helicopter service and they had several bases around the Tampa Bay area and landed in downtown Tampa and downtown St. Petersburg quite often and would refuel at Albert Wooded Airport. It was very common to see Bay Flight flying all around and it still is today. Just a few days though before this accident happened, Bayfront Medical Center started receiving complaints from homeowners in the very affluent neighborhood of Snell Isle, just on the northeast side of downtown St. Petersburg, that Bay Flight was flying too low and the noise was bothering them. Bayfront Medical Center had passed along the information to Rocky Mountain Helicopters, who advised their pilots to seek alternate routes when flying north over St. Petersburg. 
There was no specific policy on what route to choose, and the route was left to the discretion of the pilot in charge, with many of the pilots electing simply to fly a little bit further out over the water. But that wasn't the case with this pilot and not on this day. Instead, the pilot chose to fly slightly west of this neighborhood on a more northerly route and then turn east when they got closer to the big Gandy Bridge on the south side of Tampa Bay. The NTSB found that the probable cause of this accident was the pilot's failure to maintain clearance that resulted in the in-flight collision with a tower. Rocky Mountain Helicopters was very adamant in their reports at the time that this accident was not caused by a lack of information concerning the tower or other obstacles, as the obstruction had been there for 23 years and the pilot had been flying in this area for other companies for the previous 15 years. So why, on a clear and beautiful day, with a perfectly functioning helicopter, with an experienced pilot, did they crash into this tower? Well, there was a new navigation system that had recently been installed in this aircraft called an RNAV MFD GeoNet Data Link System. And while the report does mention that this system was new to the aircraft and that the pilot had used this system before at a previous employer, it has been suggested that the pilot and possibly the paramedic as he was also seated in the front of the aircraft were working with this system, possibly distracting them and causing the pilot to lose situational awareness and crash into the tower. The pilot would have most definitely had a loss of situational awareness, causing him to be distracted. Situational awareness has been studied extensively in many high dynamic professions such as commercial aviation, space flight, nuclear power and engineering, offshore oil drilling, surgery, and paramedicine. Much of what we know about situational awareness stems from many aviation accidents that happened in the 70s and 80s, especially the Eastern Airlines Flight 401, where a perfectly good Lockheed Martin L-1011 crashes in the Everglades outside of Miami, Florida, while the pilot, the co-pilot, engineer, and even the mechanic were distracted while fiddling with a burnout light bulb that they thought meant their front landing gear was not down, which it was down. And this crash killed 101 of 176 passengers and helped to pave the way for theoretical models such as situational awareness and new concepts such as crew resource management. While not a requirement back in 2000, CRM is now required of all medical helicopters that are accredited, including the medical crew as they are considered a part of the crew and are not attendants as some services used to call them. Likewise, breaking from routine may also have played a role in this accident. This pilot and this crew were used to flying back to their home base in Tampa by flying over the eastern coast of St. Petersburg, but now, due to these noise complaints, were now flying a different route. While the pilot may have been familiar with this other route, it was still a break from their regular routine. And as I mentioned above in this video, regarding a medical helicopter that crashed after running out of fuel, a study by Sarter and Alexander that was published in 2000 specifically discusses that many errors of distraction may stem from lapses of attention stemming from the interruption of a task by someone in the cockpit or front of the aircraft and then subsequently forgetting to perform an overlooked action. In this case, it is possible that the pilot and possibly the paramedic were distracted by this new piece of equipment in the cockpit, thereby causing the failure to avoid a known obstruction in a somewhat routine flight path. This accident, while absolutely tragic, also helped to pave the way for certain changes in helicopter EMS in the United States. TAWS is now recommended and almost routinely used by all medical helicopters. CRM is now a requirement of all medical helicopters which allow all members of the crew, including the flight paramedic and flight nurse, to be a part of the major safety decisions and speak up without the fear of retaliation or reprimand when they feel a safety issue has occurred. I hope that this video has provided just a bit of insight into the importance of proper technology in the cockpit, CRM, and the need for all flight crew members to keep their eyes looking out of the aircraft during flight in order to always maintain proper situational awareness. 
If you did like this video or learned even just a little bit, I do hope that you can like, share, and subscribe so I can continue making these videos in the future. Please let me know down below in the comments if you have any other stories or topics that you'd like to talk about. And as always, I appreciate you taking the time to listen and I do hope that you all have a beautiful day.